Today's podcast is sponsored by Fire Facilities Incorporated, expert engineers, designers, and manufacturers of steel training towers, burn rooms, and mobile units that are all made in the USA. Welcome back to Three Point Firefighter. Today, my guest is none other than Sean Duffy. Now, Sean is a 16-year student of the craft, and he's a firefighter paramedic for the city of Wyandotte, hope I got that right, Southeast Michigan. You already, you guys already know this if you're listening to my podcast. He's the co-founder of Build Your Culture. He also has developed a couple of programs, Searchable versus Survivable, Educated Decision Making, and also Build Your Culture, Professionalism versus Minimalism. Sean is also a proud member of the Marion County Fools Chapter, the McFools. Sean Duffy, thank you for being on my podcast, brother. How are you? Oh, thanks for having me, man. It's great to be here. So for those that are watching on YouTube, I already told Sean that this is my shirt is for Alan Brunsini or the pool party we're having one of the two, but either way, we'll go with it. Um, also, me and Sean got into a little argument about how many letters are in the alphabet in Kentucky. I'm saying 11. He is saying 26. Feel free to comment <laughs> on that. I'm pretty sure there's only 11. The rest are symbols. Like there's one for a boat and I forget what it means, but anyway. <laughs> brother sean hey listen uh i like to start yes, off with uh you tell me a little bit about you and where you fit in with your department oh man so uh my my career has been quite a journey you know it's uh i started off as a volunteer uh in hillsborough county florida when i was 18 years old right out of high school had no idea what i was doing or or even if that was the right choice to make it just kind of following in my dad's footsteps so to speak and um, I had a blast, man. I stood there, have like calling out of work just to hang out with the guys, you know, <laughs> not make any money. So I'm like, well, if I'm having this much fun there, I might be onto something here. Right. So, um, went through and, and just kind of found, uh, found my place in Sumter County, Florida, uh, a couple years later in 2009. Where's that? And Where's Sumter County at? Sumter County is just, uh, just North of, uh, of, uh, Tampa area okay okay so it's um it shares a border with uh polk county and uh marion county right in there so um it, it's a good little place you know it served me well that's uh it, that i learned a lot there you know getting on the engine just me and another firefighter really like having to wait for more help and uh you know you didn't have an officer all the time so you're just making the decisions you thought were best. And sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't. And, uh, I'll tell you right now, if they weren't, you heard about it. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it kind of, kind of helped mold you into a, uh, progressive forward thinking firefighter. You know, you always had to be a couple steps ahead and I always valued that. And, uh, you know, I was there until about 2014 and I had to move to Michigan for my family. Um, and you know, that was just a rough time. You know, Michigan is, uh, that time everyone was laying off. The budgets were, were not that great. And I had this pension waiting for me in Florida that I just really needed to go put time back into so that, you know, I had a little something. So we did that, uh, worked for Pasco County, which is, you know, a good department. They very progressive. Uh, if you follow them on, on social media, you'll see they're just doing some amazing things and you know, that took me to uh, the city of Venice where I wanted to go ahead and uh, help them with their ALS program for the first time ever. Uh, that department was going to be transporting ALS fire department. So, you know, being, being the build your culture guy and just kind of looked at that opportunity of, Hey, here's an opportunity in my career to actually help a department build something from the ground up and be a part of that. That was truly amazing. And that's where I wanted to stay, man. I love the, that department. The guys were good. You know, it had a lot of fun there. Um, a lot of potential for growth as well, but you know, as everything in my life, uh, it's all about my family. And when my family needs something, um, I don't care what it is there, you know, I'll do whatever I can to, to make sure that happens for them. And unfortunately my mother-in-law was really sick and my wife needed to be home with her. So here we are back up in Michigan and uh, working for the city of Wyandotte and loving every minute of it. So they, that is a small two station department, right? About a six square mile firehouse or fire department. And uh, man, 
when I say you walk in the doors and you're like, yeah, man, I work at a firehouse. That's, that's the way it feels. You know, it's like yeah. bringing back that first time I walked into the, the career firehouse you know, or the uh, volunteer firehouse. And uh, mm-hmm. it's a great feeling. I love working there. And uh, I don't, I don't think I'm going to ever leave, you know, until they make me anyway. So, so yeah, you're going to stay up there for a while. And you mentioned that, you know, you, when you got started in the fire service, you weren't necessarily head over heels in love with it. You kind of grew into it. What, right. So, so what was it? Was it one particular thing or just being exposed over a period of time that got you like, was, oh, okay, this is it. it? I think it was like, there was that awkwardness at first, you know, when you first start, you're like, uh, you know, I don't know if this is for me, the, you know, everyone's kind of distant because you're the new guy. Um, I think the turning point for me was after I got my first real fire, mm-hmm. you know, and seeing how that brought everybody together in the crew. And, you know, we're, we're sitting out there scrubbing hose and when you're just joking around and just reminiscing about everything. And then that morning, you know, we're all around the bumper drinking coffee and, you know, and just still telling this, so this story, cause we're still fired up. I'm like, yeah, man, this is, I've never been excited or this excited about anything in my life. That's, that's pretty cool. So I think that's what drew me to it is, is that excitement knowing that like, Hey, I could go to work any day, um, and come in here and share this with these guys. Mm-hmm. And I'm never going to be able to share this moment with anybody else the way that I can share it with them. Mm-hmm. It, this is, this is it, you know, cause you know, there's lots of good jobs out there and stuff like that. But at, at the end of the day, there's not many jobs that bring everybody close together like that. And that was just a magical moment for me. I, I think that's, that's what made me realize that this is more than just the job. You know, you're working with people that, that actually care about you and want to see you succeed. And, you know, so that meant a lot. Absolutely. And I've always said in the past that, uh, if anybody's listening to my podcast, I've heard me say that, you know, I feel bad for astronauts, fighter pilots, doctors, and lawyers, cause they couldn't be firefighters. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the best job there is. And yeah. if you're not a firefighter and you're outside of it and you're looking in, it, it probably looks horrible. You know, you're, you're trapped in a house for you know, 24, 48 hours, same people, blah, blah, blah. But it is a wonderful thing. It, it's an amazing thing. And uh, like you talked about, just sitting around when you said sitting on the bumper drinking coffee, I think that's something East Coast, West Coast, around the world, you know, every firefighter does. And there's those moments and you talk about like, maybe you have a fire and you're talking about that fire and you notice after a couple of years, you start telling that story again to that same fire. It, the details change a little bit. You might have a few more <laughs> heroes than originally you thought. And, yeah. you know, maybe the fire is a little bigger, a little hotter than you originally talked about. It kind of oh, yeah. comes up a little bit. That embellishment, you know, mm. you got to embellish it, especially if there's a new person around, you can't tell, you know, you got to make sure you, you give them a little something. So, oh yeah. A room and contents 10 years later in front of the new guys. <laughs> it's like, and the entire city was on fire. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> had a handful of babies in this arm and had a hose in this arm. And yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Yep. So what the reason I came across Sean Duffy on, on the internet a long time ago was your searchable versus survivable, your, your, your views on this. I'd like to know about it, but more than anything, I'd like to know, was there something that you saw that was being done right or something that was lacking that made you actually develop a fire program like this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Because I tell everybody when I first start the class, here's the reason why this exists. Um, I, you know, when you first start, you're just kind of following direction and and you're hoping that your senior guys or your captain or or officer or whoever, um, you just you just automatically think that they're doing what's supposed to be done. And then you just kind of fall into that, you know, way of operating. And when I was afforded the opportunity to kind of sit back a little bit more and watch these things unfold, you know, you're showing up to a fire on an ambulance. You might be a little later in, you might be first in like what, whatever, but you know, when they adopted the uh, blue card, Mm -hmm. you got level one staging. Right. So you stood right where you were until you were called to go do something. Well, that gave me a brand new perspective on everything, sitting in that position, thinking, looking at what's going on. Hey, why aren't we searching yet? Right. Why are we putting another hand line on the ground? Why are we doing all these other things? Why are we assigning people to tasks that don't, we don't need to be worrying about yet? Like the house is still on fire and nobody searched this thing, you know? So after some time of watching that unfold, and, and seeing like body recovery, you know, during overhaul um, and thinking like, man, I, I can't help but to think if, if we would have just got in there sooner and prioritize the search a little bit more and, 
you know, had better like order of assignments, could we have made a difference? You know, could that person have been alive? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. That's that's a heavy burden to carry that early in your career. Yeah. And, you know, I've pulled a lot more people out of buildings that I care to remember. And it wasn't during search and rescue efforts. Right. And I think that was the the thing that that hit me the hardest was. So why you're on a this- line pulling these people out. You're on a line on an engine. I tell yeah. You you know, a better part of my career, I was on an engine, right? So we're doing this, we're finding them late in the game, you know, um, or maybe we got assigned search and it was just, you know, 15 minutes in or, or whatever, or maybe we're on a secondary, whatever the case was. I just remember thinking like, why are we finding them now as opposed to 10 minutes ago? Or why are we just now making this um, search effort happen when we could have done it immediately. Right. Um, you know, and, and I'm not gonna lie that that really pissed me off. It pissed me off that we're pulling these people out the way we were. And the mindset of it was, Oh, well, you know, like, Hey, you know, we did the best we could type deal. Right. And we weren't doing the best we could. At least that was my opinion of it. You know, if there's gotta be a better way, you know, and, I started doing some research and I started uh, finding all the awesome stuff that firefighter rescue survey was doing. And I started talking yes, to those yes. guys, you know, oh, man. Uh, yes. Justin McWilliams. I started talking to him real early, like, Hey, help me understand this and and telling him what, what kind of my uh, thoughts were and Nick Ledeen and, and those guys. And, and I still talk to them constantly about stuff. And, you know, that, that was really the premise behind it is, Hey, I'm going to take my successes and also my failures and I'm going to develop this program based off of why I feel this is important and why we need to be prioritizing this search and putting people into these buildings immediately. And I'm not just going to put it as, Hey, this is Sean Duffy's opinion. I'm going to say, this is my opinion. And now it's backed up with data and hard facts. Here it is. Now, right? how, how far into the uh, fire service, how many years you got now at this point? November will be 17 uh, total. When I started making this program, um, I would probably had about 12 years in the fire. Oh, okay. Okay. So you had yeah. enough. You were salty at this point. Yeah. I, you weren't like a like three year guy or something like that. No, no, no. Like, so <laughs> not to get down a rabbit hole, but that is one of my biggest pet peeves is three or four year guy. And I understand like places are different. You know, they might have a, a ton of experience depending on where they work, but, um, you know, a three or four year guy, just, you just don't have enough of that. You, you're free to your opinion and everything else like that. But, you know, at that point, there's this thing called like fire service parody. And I think the young impressionable minds are really good at that. They, where they, they take something and they just repeat it. And it's like, oh, well, I'm in the fire service. Yes. Yes, you are. But there's a difference between putting something in perspective based off of your own experiences, which you probably still have to to gain right versus just repeating something that somebody said because you believe in it and that's okay like i'm not i'm not trying to take anything away from anybody i just i guess what i'm saying is i didn't want to be that guy like i did truly did not know any different you know i'm just doing what my department told me i needed to do and it wasn't until i looked at myself and said hey you know if if I'm frustrated about this and everything else like that, then I need to challenge myself and I need to ask myself why I believe the things that I do. And that's where I found the data. And I guess that's my point is at three or four years on, if that is, if that is where you're at, do yourself a favor and don't just repeat what somebody else has already said or done. Do your research, figure out why, why do you feel that way? You know? And that's, because, that's one of the bigger problems in the fire service right now. Anyway, well, over, over a period of the past, say, 15 years, uh, people are doing and uh, doing stuff that they've always done. That's why we've always done it. And when UL NIST studies and UL FSRI studies come out and it shows that we should be doing things a little different, they don't really grab onto that because right. what, of what you're saying. Right. And, and that's what I'm saying. That's that. There's so much information out there. Like the best thing you could do is challenge, challenge yourself, challenge your department. Like, hey, why are we doing this? Right. What's, what's the, show me the data behind that the way we've always done it is the best way to do it. 
and then we won't have a conversation. But I'm asking you that if we're all here for the civilians, right, and we're supposed to be here for each other and all these other things, then why are we not looking in to all the information we have there? It blows my mind. When you talk to a guy who's got 20 plus years on the job and you talk about these UL studies and they have zero clue what you're even talking about. Yeah. Governor's that, that should not be acceptable. No, yeah. No. You Absolutely. know, like, look at all the magazines we have. We have, you know, fire engineering. We have firehouse. We have fire rescue one. Like there are so many magazines that can get delivered to your firehouse on top of the ability to learn this stuff, you know, UL's got their, their academies that they can do, right. Mm -hmm. Their online training Academy. There's plenty of places. Yeah. Their online stuff is really top shelf and it is, it's basically updated with every experiment. (laughs) Right. That's what I'm saying. Like this information is not hard to find. Right. Like if you truly cared and you really wanted to find it, you'd be able to find it. And I think that's what frustrated me. That's where I was when I started creating this, this program is, I'm view. I'm like expressing my views to people I'm working with and they're making me feel like I'm the only one that felt that way. Right. Like this is after you've got the data. This is after you, you've said, Hey guy, cause that was one of my questions is after you develop a program program like this, how do you, how is it received by your own people? Uh, we know how it's received nationwide, but your own people, right. how do they, how do they bite into that? Well, I'm glad you asked that because so here was part of my problem. And I'll always be transparent with everybody. I don't care. You know, it's, it's, it's important that we, we tell people things like that. And my approach was off at first because I was, I was fired up. I was angry. Right. And I was just coming at them. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're doing. Like, look at this. And that was just really the wrong way to do stuff. (laughs) Um, which is driven sometimes passion is better not at the beginning but right in the middle of something right (laughs) yeah no passion is one of those things man it could be like your best friend or your worst enemy right like it's all about how it's applied and dude that was a hard lesson for me to learn but to answer your question when i learned how to deliver things to where it doesn't come off like undermining or like your your um telling somebody like pretty much hey you're stupid right (laughs) um in my department, uh, it's received pretty well. It has been, um, for the most part, since I started this journey, it has been received pretty well once I learned my my approach needed to be changed. Um, I just <laughs> ask, I say, <laughs> why do you feel that way? Like, I will tell you why I feel the way that I do. Yeah. And then I will show you the information that supports that. Right. And everyone's free to their own opinion and that's fine. And, and I will never chastise you for having your own opinion. I just want to know why you feel that way and what supports that claim. Right. 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 Now, how so many times do you though, do you get that? Well, I don't care what you say. I don't care what proof you have, what science you've used. I'm still doing it this way. I mean, how many times have you heard I, that? Oh dude, I've, I've heard that many times. And I, <laughs> and I usually just chuckle and laugh. I say, okay, Hey man, that's, that's fine. You do you, but I just, I'm going to let you know that if I'm the one on the nozzle, or if I'm the one that's lead searcher or any of these things, this is how it's going to be done because I know better. And I have this saying, like people get mad all the time when you like want them to elevate themselves. Right. Right. But they never get mad when they want you to bring yourself down to their level. Right. Boom. Truth bomb. Truth bomb. my, My quote to that is how come, right. When I expect you to rise to my, level of expectations, we've got a problem, right? But if you expect me to lower myself to your standards, there's no problem, right? Like it doesn't make any sense to me, right? So it's like, I am not going to settle for something that you want because you're okay with being a a minimalist and putting forth bare minimal effort because in your mind, hey, the job got done. Nobody died. We all went home. Like that's not acceptable to me. No, that's basing your success right. on lack of failure. That's exactly right. Absolutely. So the way I chose to approach that is like, that's fine. Hey man, you know, I'm not going to win over the hearts of everybody. I get it. You know, you're stuck in your ways and then that's cool. But here's the reality. I'm not going to change a damn thing that I do just to suit your needs or your wants. Um, you have two options. You could challenge yourself to see like, am I really doing all that I could? Do I need to be better? Or you could stay status quo. But at some point in this, something's going to happen, whether it be in the firehouse or the fire ground, 
that that person's going to look at and be like, damn, maybe he's on to something. And, and did you ever have one of those questions? Did you ever have one of those where you, you bring a live person out of a fire and one of your doubters right there and you just look at them, hold the person and say, suck a bag of eggs, boom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Um, the funniest thing about that is like, I, I really enjoy thermal imaging work. Uh, I think it's a great tool, um, but we still have a lot of mindset of, oh, just turn the thing on and point it and no, nobody yes. really, you know, they just don't fully understand. Absolutely. So we're at this fire and I'm with my buddy um, really close with, and, and I'm looking, I'm like, that, that, that thing's going to light off. The smoke's just pushing out of the attic, you know? And I'm like, they've got to get in there and put some water on that thing. That, that thing's just going to, it's just going to go. So we told the, uh, IC like, Hey man, you want us to go pull that gable? He goes, what for? I said, well, we got to put some water on that thing. That smokes like 300 degrees. And he's like, you don't put water on smoke. And I said, okay, no problem. <laughs> Two seconds later. My, yeah. I looked at my buddy and I sat there and I was like, this is going to be interesting. Like just sit and wait, man. And he's like, what? I'm like, you see that smoke starting to lay down when it gets to the other side of that, it hits that oxygen. It's going to go, it's going to light off. He's like, you think so? I'm like, just wait and sure shit. That's what happens. Right. Yeah. Boom. Now we're scrambling for a hose line to put water into a space that we could have prevented that from happening. If you just understood what your thermal imaging camera was telling you. Right. Right. And that's kind of the whole premise of, of that whole thing is, hey, I'm going to throw the information out there and you're going to make your own opinion, right? You're either going to agree or disagree and that's fine. But in that moment, when that happened, that IC came back to me and was like, how the hell did you know that was going to happen? I said, well, I had all the information I needed, sir. I had this thermal imager. I know how to read it. I know what it's telling me. I'm thinking one step ahead. This is why it's important that we know our tools and how to use them. And we know the data that we, we have now, and we know how that correlates to what we're doing here on the fire ground. And, um, that's really all it took for him. You know, he would come back all the time and ask me thermal imaging questions. And, and I was fine. I never once said, I told you so, right. I never chastised him about it. I didn't talk shit to him or about him to anybody. Cause that stuff doesn't need to happen. All that needs to happen is, Hey, we've had this conversation. I've given you the material that you need to know, read it, understand it, ask questions. Don't all that's up to you. But at some point when you start seeing the success that other people are having by listening to the information and applying it, then you, maybe you'll come back around full circle and start wondering why, you know, people are more successful using that than wondering why we burnt down a whole city block. Exactly. Now I got to stop you there. You've said, you said, uh, uh, the S word twice. I don't cuss on my podcast. Cause once you start cussing, I fucking start cussing and then the shit goes <laughs> boom. You know what? Never mind. I heard it. I heard it. Fuck it. Never mind. Uh, no, uh, sorry. I'm just, <laughs> sorry. I'm feeling sassy today. Um, so uh, along with that story and what you were saying earlier, it's, there's a truth that the, an ugly truth of the fire service is, uh, some people in positions, don't want to be told that they're wrong. Our ego was so inflated that we would rather believe if, if I'm a, if I'm an instant commander, uh, I, I don't, you just leave me alone. Let me do my job. You're giving him hard and fast information based on data that you've learned again, not in the fire, not, not on the fire ground in the firehouse. You know, that's where you want to learn that stuff. And, uh, right. and you also mentioned, you know, when you were doing build your culture with your department, you had people, you know, maybe not as supportive as, as probably they should be because what you said earlier, you know, they'd rather you come down than them come up. It's an ego driven department. It really is. And I get that. I understand that. You know, it boils down to, to one simple thing. There's only two things that we can control our attitude and our effort. Right. Yeah. That's it. Yep. So, you know, if you don't want to hear it, it doesn't matter what you're presented with. You know, if your attitude sucks, and you don't want to put forth the effort to change it. And somebody could be offering you a million bucks. You're still going to look at it and say something stupid like, oh, that's fake money. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> in, your, in your mind, you've already made a decision based on your bias, right? Or your biases, whatever you have. And it may never change, right. no matter what you're presented with. So um, you got to really pick and choose where you want to have those battles and, and, Really, I have found that it's better to, to focus your efforts into the people that, that want to listen right. 
<clears throat> because over time they're going to adapt to that same mindset. And sooner or later, that one person or that two or three people that are fighting against it, they're not going to have a choice, but to change anyway. So it's like, you know what? I'm not going to waste my time with you and argue about this over and over and over again. I'm just going to wait to the moment till it's presented to you to where you don't have a choice. And this is now our, our, our standard mode of operation. Right. So that's one of the hardest things when I became a, a, the training chief for my department about eight years ago, of course, I knew for a fact that I was going to get everybody on board with training. Everybody was going to, you know, and, and that just wasn't the case. And one of the hardest things I had to realize about two or three years into it is the people that don't want to change. I can't do anything for, I literally cannot, you know, I can show them the data. I can teach them VEIS. They're not going to change. Here's they they just don't want to. Cause so, right. to, to my point earlier, you ch- changing means you were wrong in the first place to, to some degree. So the hardest thing I ever had to realize was like, you know, I got to cut you loose, bro. I mean, you're coming to my classes. You're doing everything I tell you to do in training, but you argue with it. You don't do it on the fire ground. So I got to focus on all those people that are, that are actually, you know, taking this information in and trying to use it. Yeah. And you know, it's, I got two daughters, right. Mm -hmm. And one, one's eight and one's five and they're, they're two very different girls. Right. So I've got to handle things with my youngest, a lot different than I handle with my oldest. You know, when I first became a dad and, and I bring the story up because, you know, in the firehouse, I mean, that's pretty much what we're dealing with is children, right? Like right. just grown children. And oh, <laughs> by the way, that's Sean Duffy saying that, not me. Although I agree <laughs> with him totally. <laughs> 100. It, it's, it's crazy. The, the correlations you find, but you know, when, when my oldest is doing something that I don't agree with and I don't want her to do that, it is, she is not receptive. If all I do is hammer her with what she's doing wrong. Right. Right. She's a lot more receptive. If you look at her and you tell her all of the things she's doing right, and then bring it back in and say, so with that being said, you have done this or that, and this is why we don't need to be doing that. Do you understand? She's more apt to go. Yes, dad, I understand. Versus, Hey, what are you doing? I've told you 10 times not to do this. Why are you still doing it? Right now she's frustrated and she's on the defense. Right. So when I learned that with my kids and I took that back to the firehouse, I'm like, man, and this is why I say we're just a bunch of kids because it's the same way. It's the same way. If you're like, Hey man, great job on that fire. Uh, that you threw that ladder. Awesome. You did this, 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 but I did notice that maybe you didn't have this camera with you, or maybe you didn't do this or whatever. Like, Tell me why, like, what, what's up with that? Why did you do that? And now you're having a conversation. They're more apt to talk about the things that they did not do. Right. And then you can bring it back in and say, okay, well, Hey, if you would have had that camera or you would have done this, maybe a little different, like probably been a little easier on you. And this is why. Right. right. My, you know, my wife, it's funny that you, you tie into the, the kids and the fire department thing, because I've always said that just not out loud because firefighters get so upset when you say, Oh yeah, I'm acting like a kid. No, and I'm not saying you're acting like a kid. I'm just saying there's similarities in how like leadership works with children and it works with firefighters because Absolutely. you really, you live with both. And that's one of the things like, if you do an eight to five job, you're an accountant, you're not going to know, you're probably never going to see those kids of the person that works two cubicles over. Okay. You're not going to know about them going to be, you know, they're going to be in sixth grade next year, blah, blah, blah. In the fire service, you know, everything about all the people you work with. So it's easier to equate that to the firefighters you work with. Um, but my wife taught me something early, early on in parenting that I've used in the fire service and it works really well. She says, you got to replace the word, but, and use the word and. So when you're talking to somebody and you say, but, you know, Hey, you know, you threw that ladder, but I saw you drag that hose and that was good. But, you know, you just replace it with, and it's more of an upbeat. And to your point, they're more, they're more open to listening and probably more self-critique. I mean, they'll probably say, you know what, you're right, but I could have done this better. Yeah. And and we all should be, you know, like, listen, like I'm not perfect. I mess up all the time. And and I like it that way. I like it because if I'm messing up daily, that means I still got stuff to learn. Right. Right. I still got things I can work on that. That should be everybody's mindset. The problem comes in when you let our, your ego get in the way where people feel like you think you are perfect. And you have to do everything the way that they do it. And that, you know, they're looking at everything that you're doing. So they're waiting for you to mess up because they don't ever mess up. And I tell you, like, I hate being around people like that. 
I can't stand it. You could be the smartest firefighter. You could be like the baddest dude out there. I don't want to be around you because your mentality is all about yourself and focusing on what people are doing wrong rather than saying, Hey, how can I take my strengths, couple it, you know, to make their weaknesses better. And we could do this as a team, right? Because it, it really all boils down to like, we care about each other. We should care about each other. Right. And when I come at somebody and I say, Hey, um, this, we, sh- we don't need to do this anymore because here's the data and everything else. It's not that I'm singling them out and saying, you suck. It's saying, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I want to be better. I want you to be better collectively. I want us to be better. Right. right. There's going to be things that that person does far better than, than the way that I do it, but we have to learn how to work together and have that common understanding of why, why are we doing the things we're doing? Right. And how can we improve upon them moving forward? Because when you do that, then you step off the truck. There's no conversation. There's just action. Right. And then you talk later. Right. And that's what we should all strive for is like, hey, we all know we're on the same page. This, this, this simultaneously. Right. And then when we're on the line or whatever, I'd be like, hey, hit that or, you know, do whatever you got to do. The problem is. And I've seen it over and over again. I'm sure you have, or, or maybe the listeners have like you get on scene and everyone's like, Hey, what do I do? What do you want me to do? Like that should not even be a conversation. That right. is failure to plan on all of our parts. Yeah. Right. And that's really all this is you asking about in a roundabout way, searchable versus survivable. Hey, these things, when you show up on scene are a failure to plan. So right. if we can plan ahead of time and we can train, right. And we could do all these things and start implementing this. And there's no question. Hey, why did you take that window on VES? Like, hey, why did you go in and search ahead of the hand line? Why did you do all these things? You know exactly why. Right. You know what I mean? So that's just my my thought on it. Well, so when you develop the program, and I'm sure like anything else, the more you present it, the more you talk to different people, the more people contact you, you, you get other ideas that you can add or maybe take away uh, to make your program more uh, you know, up to date every, every time you teach it, kind of like Aaron Fields says, every time he teaches, he goes back and writes everything down in a journal, basically what he could do better. Right. Mm-hmm. So what, what are you seeing? What is, hasn't changed? Like if you had to tell somebody, if you had, you could teach a three minute class and that's it, you got three minutes to teach a class on how to, uh, you know, searchable versus survivable. What, what would you tell them? What hasn't changed? Searchable space. That has not changed. There's always, you know, I mean, that's what we have to look at. So where I'm going with that is we preach 360s all the time. Right. But we, we generally focus on fire when we're doing our 360s. Take that 360 to focus on searchable space at the same time. Right. Right. Because when you're done, you've targeted all your search areas. At the same time, you've figured out where you're putting your line and all these other things. You've made it a lot easier on yourself. And it's easier to guide your crews. So, for example... If I show up and I only have two guys on my engine and the next two engine shows up during that 360, I already know, hey, I got to send my fire attack in this direction. I got to send my search team over here to prioritize these bedrooms because statistically that's where victims are most likely to be right now, right? Mm -hmm. So knowing all of that and just taking all of that information, sizing it down into your size up on your 360 will give you a lot more success versus, okay, so I got this line stretch. Maybe I need to do this. Maybe I throw a ladder. I got to do all this other stuff. Like make it simple. The ladders can come later unless you're doing like a second floor VES or something. Mm-hmm. Ladders can come later. Like the safest place for us to be on the fire ground is in that building. Because again, statistically, when things happen, we're either going to self-rescue or we're, or we're rescued by another crew already on the interior. Mm-hmm. So let's, let's start mitigating the problems, right? the fire, which is the threat to us all, and then start ventilating and searching and and making the conditions better so we can start removing these victims. Because if you're only capable of doing one part of that equation, nobody's lives get saved, right? Right. I think that would would be where I would want to put that emphasis is, hey, we literally have less than eight minutes to make this happen, right? So get on it, do that 360, and get, get everything going in motion. So you're doing your 360. You might say something as you're okay. Let me back up a little bit. So 
talking to different firefighters around the country, I've had some that do their 360 and then report back after the 360. And then I've got some, which is my preference, that reports as we're doing it. Right. So listening to what you're saying, you might say something to the effect of, hey, you know, uh, you know, there's there's uh, the fires in the, you know, D side, uh, probably victims in the A side or something like that or the bedroom, whatever. You're reporting that as you're doing your 360. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I, so here's why I would say yes, to definitely do that, because let's let's keep in mind, you're not just talking to the people that are on scene. You're talking to the people that are also coming still. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. So why am I going to wait to either give an assignment or tell people what's going on or whatever until they arrive on scene? I hated that. When I showed up, I hated that. Like I wasn't told anything, just report to level one. Okay. Am I preparing for an assignment? Like, what am I doing here? Like, right. You'd listen to the radio, but it wasn't precise enough. Like for example, um, Engine 10, we're on scene. We have a fully involved structure. Okay, well, I'm showing up in an ambulance. Okay, that's the that's the report that I get from the first due engine. Um, we're pulling a line. This is defensive attack. So in my mind, what do I already think? There's nothing we're going to do except pull a bunch of hand lines and spray water on the outside. Right. Right. So I make the decision. I tell my partner, hey, don't go down the street. The engine went down. Um, go up one more street. We're going to get like a full view of this house, right? Because we can, we'll just cut through the lot. Right. So we go, I get the alpha side. Okay. Didn't look like it was really on fire. Got the Bravo side. Turn down the street. Oh, there it is. It's the Charlie side. That's rocking real good. And the Delta side where the garage is, it's got some fire coming out. So really what we have is we have the backside of the house heavily involved in fire but you just said it's fully involved and everybody else is slowing down. Right? right. So it would have been better, you know, looking at it now to say, Hey, we have a heavily involved fire on the uh, Charlie side of the structure. Have my next unit pull a, sec a secondary line and attack this from the alpha side. I need search and rescue uh, underway immediately. They're already attacking the fire from the outside. Right. right. So they're, they're addressing the issue. So you're going to put another line interior to try and hopefully pinch off that, but also support the search. Right. Had they said something like that, no doubt in my mind, everybody showing up knows what their job is right now. Next due engine, I got to pull a line. Let's go. If I'm the next due ambulance or next due engine, I already know I'm going in right behind them for search and rescue. Right. So it's kind of like, so like it, get say, making that grab, uh, saving that citizen. If you imagine it like a, a lottery ticket, you got six numbers. Just on your 360, you're giving somebody three of those three guaranteed numbers, winning your numbers, right? You're like, yeah, okay, I, I mean, that's what, it, why would you even not listen and not act on that information or well, try to, yeah. or convey the, because honestly, the, the, the first one on the scene has to convey that information to your point. Yes. Yeah. You have to, doing a 360 is great. It's totally useless if you don't communicate what you see. Right. Yes. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. I can't tell you how many fires have gone on and they've just sized up the fire only. Mm -hmm. And that's where they've stopped. And I've shown up and I'm like, man, there's so much to do. Like I'm looking around at everything. I'm like, man, there's so much that needs to happen right now. We need vertical vent. Like we need all these things, but because they are in that mindset of, Hey, I'm only sizing up the fire and I'm going to report what I have on fire conditions and what we're going to do to address that. It's kind of like left up to hopefully the IC will show up and formulate that plan or the next arriving engine company or, or something like that. And it's like, Hey, if we could give everybody as much information as we can about what's going on in that whole scene right now, you set the stage for everybody else coming in and there's no questions about it. Right. Right. It just makes sense to me. So that's, that's what I've learned over the years is like, Hey, we've got to get better at that. You know? Looking for hazards, looking for fire, looking for life, all of it. Yeah. So when we're looking at our 360, to your point, we're not we're not just looking for fire. We're looking for how to save the citizens in the fire. Yes. So you're 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 really. So I've noticed there's a default. Well, this has been my experience. There's a default setting in the fire service. You know, you uh, you pull the engine in front of a burning building. You pull the cross site, which I'm I'm not for putting in front of a burning building. That's just been my. I've seen that a lot where they sure. 
parking right there. And then they, they pull the same hand line, same nozzle, even though they got choices on both. And then they go in the front door regardless. Uh, and then uh, here's my question though. Ha, what about, I've seen this a lot where the uh, truck company will come in and go through the door that the engine went through by default. What do you think about yeah. that? So I think that front door gets abused way too often. Exactly. Okay? Exactly. Uh, it's not the only way into a building and it shouldn't be the only way in for a building. Uh, I, I, I was at a fire recently where I saw three lines get stretched and all of them went through the front door and I'm looking and I'm like, why are we stretching three lines through the front door? Wouldn't it make sense to have another line coming in from a different location? One, so you're not crowding the front door, right. but two, um, it just makes sense to me. There's more than one side of this house, right? Uh, we also need here, we have basements, right? And if you don't have basements, maybe you have a second story. You need to protect those, that stairway. So if the first line is going to the fire, the second line should be protecting that stairway, right? right? Like, just makes sense to me to come in from different locations. Um, we don't do that. Also, we talked about VES. Um, that no, can only happen really... on a second or, or higher floor, right? That's <laughs> right. That's yeah, all yeah. VES is for. <laughs> that's all it is, is two stories. Yeah, no, and, and I hate that because oh, it's yeah. like, hey, we do have single story residences, you know, and even if it is a two story, the fire might be on the first floor, you know, it's like, hey, you don't always have to VES a second floor, you know. Where the reason why I'm going with that is um, we could do all kinds of things. We could do lines over ladders. So throw a ladder, throw a line up there and get in there. And, you know, maybe that's the most direct route rather than the front door. Or, hey, here's a concept. What do we teach when it comes to VES or fire tech? Get the people closest to the threat, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we want to search closest to the threat and we want to put our hand line in play closest to the fire. So if I show up to this house and the front door is not the closest, but taking this window is why would I not pull a line and go through that window straight and put it right, right there, right there, exactly. save time. Okay. And then guess what else I can do now? I can start my search from that location and the guy that's on that nozzle can peel off the heel and start searching behind the nozzle man. Mm -hmm. So we're improving our ability to search areas. Why we also improved our, our fire attack front door, not a bad choice. If it makes sense, Right. But it shouldn't be our under our number one all the time. And I'm sure you've seen it too. Hey, uh, engine engine one's on scene. We got whatever. Hey guys, pull a line to the front door while I do my 360. And then during that 360, he goes, Hey, never mind, pull the line over here. Right. So now you you pull the line to where you thought was going to be the entrance point. So just hey, take that little moment, right? And, and just be sure that that's where you're going to go before you just go through the front door. Cause once that's open, you're committed. And dude, I, I don't know if I can get there 30 seconds faster. I want to be there 30 seconds faster. Sure. In the first, the, the first, uh, fire truck, fire engine, whatever on the scene sets the tone for the rest of it. So if oh, they yeah. don't pull past and, and see three sides to your point, you, you could, you, I mean, you may not make that, that mistake of pulling that line of the front door. If you pass, the, the, the house on fire just a little bit so you can see all three sides and then you're not blocking you're taking that aerial truck and you're using the whole thing you're not taking you know 20 30 feet off that ladder because you've parked in front so the first right. the, the tone is totally set by that first company oh 100 and this is where it comes into like not just knowing your data and stuff like that and why you're doing the things but knowing your equipment right knowing mm -hmm. what's on your truck like let's say you have a 200 foot line okay well i stopped right here in front of the house and I got to pull 200 feet <laughs> and I got all this extra line in the yard and all this other stuff that we're tripping over and we're fighting with. Hey yeah. man, you know, uh, <laughs> it'd be a lot easier. Let's say your setbacks 50 feet there. You ate, you ate up 50 foot of hose right there in your setback. So cool. Right. Now you got 150 feet. Cool. Why don't you go two houses down? So you got the Bravo side, you got the alpha side, you got the Delta side view. And now you're stretching line. The only thing for the officer to do is have to run to the back of the house and check it out real quick yeah. while you're stretching line. So that, that cuts out a lot of that guesswork, but it's also, Hey, how much more efficient is it to eat up a uh, hose on the street and in the yard so that we don't have all this mess to, to handle. We don't have all these kinks to manage and like all this stuff, like all of that makes a difference. Well, you sure. know what I mean? Like kinks kill firemen. So why are we chasing kinks around? Just you're talking about just two houses away, 
Right. It's not a big deal. Pull you know, you up get, on an angle. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the, I've tried to get that where, where I'm at, we're a city fire department. So we don't have a lot of far, you know, setback. We have a few setbacks are kind of back there, but we have two 200 foot pre-connects and I'm just like, oh, drives me nuts. Drives yeah. me nuts. Cause it'll get pulled nice. And we'll get right to the door nice. <laughs> it's just <laughs> fucked up after that. It's just a big hot mess. And then God yeah. forbid somebody say, get another line. Now you got twice the mess. You know, oh, yeah. no, big, it's... For us, I'm a big fan of 150. I have both. I have 150, you have 200, whatever. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. yeah. So oh, yeah. Um, what you talk about, though, in searchable versus survival, really transcends more than just the civilians, right? I mean, because you're looking at RIT operations. You're, oh, yeah. I, mean, I mean, you're looking at the whole nine yards. When, when you say the word search, that really is such a big umbrella for so much of what we do, right? Mm -hmm. VES, all that stuff. So how do you, is, do you find it hard to narrow it down just to that one subject? You know, we're just dealing with the citizens. How does it not veer off into, well, also this works because if you've got down brother or down sister, you can do this. Or here's how, how could you not go into VES which is another rabbit hole that could take, I mean, that's a whole nother animal, but it, oh, it yeah. underneath what you're teaching. So I mean, how do you avoid going down that rabbit hole or do you? We do. And, and what we do is we, we structured the program to where it's chopped up in different sections, right? So every section kind of builds on top of each other and leads you into the next one. And, you know, I tell everybody like life safety is our number one priority. That has never changed. Right. Well, life safety doesn't mean just the civilians. Life safety also means don't do dumb shit. So I have to come get you. And <laughs> God forbid that something does happen that neither one of us can control that we know how to mitigate that too. Right. right. Um, there's three things in my opinion that every firefighter needs to be very, very proficient at. And that is search fire attack and self-rescue or red operations. And the reason why I say that is, Hey, if you and I are on a search team, I could preach search all day long and you'd be like, yeah, I just took Sean's class. I'm fired up. We're going to go search now. And you fall into a hole in the floor. No longer becomes a search operation. This is now a May day. Right. right? So am I going to wait for the RIT team? That's their job, right? right. Only 6% of the time though, when they're activated, they actually are the ones that remove those firefighters. And it takes upwards to 12 firefighters and over 20 minutes to do. It's rarely so the first RIT team to get to you saves you. Right. So wouldn't it be better? And this is what we teach. Wouldn't it be better if you were really stout in victim removal techniques, firefighter removal techniques, so that if this does happen to either A, you, or B, somebody inside that building, you are not a liability. You're an asset. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Hey, there comes a point in every fire where the search, you've done everything you could. Right. Maybe, maybe you got to complete the search. Great. Maybe you only got two rooms, but that's all you can do. You have to abort that. Right. I'm going to tell you right now, and this is a taboo subject. I know it is. It pisses a lot of people off. The civilians are my number one priority. However, when that changes and you go down, you are now my number one priority. Right. Sorry. Right. Because I have an obligation to you as well. And there's this idea of, oh, well, you have air and gear. That's great but that is also very limited. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Hey, maybe we understand what's going on here. And we say, I was assigned to search and some shit happened. And now I have to rescue one of our own. You need to send another search team in here to finish what we started because we have something we're doing right now. Right. Right. Versus the whole like, Oh, well, what do you say? The down fireman first or the civilian first, that should not even be a debate. We could save both of them at the same time. Right. Right. It, it doesn't, it's not a big deal. So I, I, I don't know. And again, this is, this is a little off subject, but in that class, that's why we teach, Hey, search and rescue are not the same thing. Search is the act of physically locating the person. And once you've done that, that's where your rescue comes in. If you're only physically capable of doing one part of those equation or one part of that equation, nobody's life gets saved. Okay. So I can hammer all day long civilian removal techniques, but we also have to incorporate the firefighter side of it. Mm -hmm. we, we have to, because you know what? I might have to take you out. And if all I've ever trained on and all I've ever taught in search classes is victim removal for civilians, 
then I've kind of left you at a disadvantage because again, you're waiting for the writ team to come in and do something because you don't have the knowledge, right? Or you haven't been given the opportunity to practice that enough to, to see how a victim removal translates into a firefighter removal. Right. right. So we do cover it. We kind of go all the way around. We do VES, we do victim removal. We do um, terminology, like being cognizant of your terminology and, and why words are powerful, you know, and uh, you kind of, Staring clear of the um, the profiling, you know, and saying like, hey, it's just search. Like, this is what we're after. We're sizing up our search effort. Call it whatever you want. I don't really care. Just make sure that everybody knows what you're talking about. Because when I tell you, hey, what does risk mean? And you give me a different definition than five other people, then clearly we have a problem, Right. You go work in McDonald's or Taco Bell or any of these places, and you say, I want a number five. Everybody knows what a number five is. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I like that. Yeah. That's good. It, there's no question about it. So why are, why are we not doing that in the fire service? Right. And that's really what we try and get after in this is like, hey, here's the data. Here's how it is. Here's what I think we should be saying because it's easy and there's no mistake. Everybody knows what sizing up the search effort means. Give me a search size up. You already know what that means. Right. Right. So if I say like, uh, you know, what's tenable space, you might have a different definition. Right. 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 But if I say, hey, what's searchable space? And everybody understands that searchable space is a place that we can occupy with our bunker gear and get in and make a search happen then there should be no question from the outside with what you're looking at, if that is searchable space or not. It's that, that old saying, um, risk a little, save a little, risk a lot, save a life, risk yeah. nothing to save nothing, but they're all subjective. You know, what's a lot, you know, right. risk, risk a little, what, what's a little to you, what's a little yeah. to me, you know? So yeah, I can see, uh, I've always said though, that just about every aspect of the fire service can be made better with better communication, clearer communication. That's all it is. Yeah. It's it really is. Yeah. You know, and it's funny. Go ahead. No, no, you, you, you're, you're the guest. I'll talk to myself later. I'm, I <laughs> no. know how I sound. <laughs> I got nothing to bring to this conversation. I'm just listening. <laughs> yeah. You only got those 11 letters of the alphabet. That's right? it. It's hard. It's hard. So asked me to, you know, write a, like a paper for college. And I was like, I, I'm got 11 letters, Buck. That's all it's going to be. <laughs> well, they, That's it. Here's, here's what I like. You brought up risk and uh, Jay Bonnyfield and I talked about this a while ago and, and we had an awesome conversation and, and, and really, like at the end of the conversation, what we both realized was like there is literally no definite definition of what risk means in the fire service. Right. There's none. But yet we write policies and procedures on them. Right. Like you said, risk a lot, save a lot, uh, risk a little, save a little risk versus benefit analysis, like all those things. And, and although I think like it's good intention it creates a lot of problems because what you're willing to risk and what I'm willing to risk could be two very different things. And where do we draw the line? You know, is, is an acceptable risk, first degree burns, second degree, third degree burns, incapacitation, death, like what is it? Exactly. Right? So when we look at these pictures and we go to keyboard warrior, like the fire service loves to do on social media, <laughs> Right. Only the good firefighters comment, right? Yeah, <laughs> the only, that's it. Yeah. That's oh, how you yeah. the good firefighters are calling. <laughs> that's like it. Some bitch no, don't have a big enough line. Look, look at that. He's using automatic <laughs> nozzle, that piece of shit. <laughs> right. It, that, and that's the whole point, right? Yeah. So like you look at these pictures and you're like, oh, like you see this a lot with the go, no go decision making that people post on, on social media. And, you know, those conversations are hilarious, but it's true. I mean, that's the same shit that happens when we're on the fire ground. If I put up a picture of a firefighter coming out a window that's got fire rolling out of it, people are gonna be like, what an idiot. I can't believe he went in there. Yeah. But he doesn't know, or they don't traditionally know what took place before that picture was taken. And then I ask everybody this. Okay, cool. So let's just go with what we know, which is what we see. Is this success or failure? He doesn't have a victim. He's bailing out. He's come down the ladder. Is that success or failure? If he had a victim, would that be success or failure? Is that person risking any more 
than the person on the fire ground that's just shooting from the hip and has zero idea with what they're doing. Right. Mm -hmm. And those are questions meant to make you ask or think like, huh, I wonder about this for a second, because that is the reality. Everybody looks at something and they see it through their own lens and they form their own opinions about things and whatever. And then we make a policy about it. Well, the, the policy, the person who made that policy, their definition of an acceptable risk could be very different than a very well rounded experienced firefighter making a decision based off of known truths, Mm -hmm. right? Based off of experience of, Hey, I've done this before. I know how much time I have, like I can get in there and get out or I know when conditions are changing to where they're not favorable for me, or I can look at this and say, Hey, you know what? I can't get to this right now. Everything on this fire will be searched at some point, but right now my skill set is better used over here where I have a better chance of making a, a good aggressive search and finding somebody. Right. So, so I bring that up because I want people to start thinking about risk and why they say the things they do like, Oh, risk a lot, save a lot. Great. What does that mean to you? Because I see you type it all over the internet all the time, you know, chastising everybody for the tactics they chose to do. But what does that mean to you? Based on a 30 second clip they've seen. <laughs> 30 second clip. And it, what it really goes back to is like earlier in this podcast, I said, what fire service parody. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what that is. Yep. It's fire service parody. You have no idea why you're saying what you're saying. You're just using it as an excuse to back up why you feel the way you feel. And then you get questioned and there's, there's no rebuttal right. because you don't have data or information to, to support your claim. The big thing is, is context, especially on so, uh, social media warriors. Um, one of the classes I teach, there's a, v- a short video and I'm going to have a hard time to explain it. You probably, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but basically it's these firefighters uh, teaching a, a live fire and it's in a garage and fire's rolling. And then at some point the garage door, the garage door falls. And I don't know if you've seen that one. Yeah, I've seen it. So I like to show that. And then everybody says, well, I can't, they would have got somebody killed if somebody was in there. And then they'll say, well, they didn't really, because it's a 1403 class, this particular class I'm talking about. And they didn't follow 1403. I'm saying, okay, let's watch it again. So we watch it again. And if you watch it through a 1403 lens, they are doing everything just about 1403. Now, when that door closes, that's when I tell them, okay, you've, you've already typed on, uh, social media, these guys are idiots. They could have got somebody killed, but it was Grand Rapids, Michigan, and they were doing exactly that. They were testing different ways to hold up garage doors and they tested a bunch of methods. So it, it's exactly what they wanted to happen, how they wanted it to happen, and they were getting information for the fire service. And then when I tell them that, they're like, oh, I, I said, yeah. So you got to be careful when you get on there and type in all this stuff. What, what it, what's really fun for anybody that's listening, if you see somebody really aggressively going at somebody on a comment, look at their profile and see how long they've been a firefighter. That's the best ones. That's <laughs> yeah. when, you know, I've, I've been a firefighter for two whole years and okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah, two yeah. whole years. Yeah. 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 Two, was that, that in a row that. or <laughs> not, not to sound like crappy towards anybody, but I, I love when that happens because you got a lot of like two, three year guys out there and uh, they'll make these like Facebook pages and stuff like that. And then they can share all this stuff. And there's like, listen, I applaud your effort. And I really love your passion. However, let's not kid anybody. In the two to three years that you've been a firefighter, there's no freaking way you learned all this shit. Unless you're like <laughs> Detroit. <laughs> you right. know, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And, and like I said, like it sounds terrible to say, but it's the truth. Like, hey, those are the guys that are most likely to be hitting that keyboard real hard right. or the opposite the guys who have been in the fire service for so long and they use their time as like a gauge of how good they are, mm-hmm. but they run like 400 calls a year and they've been to like one structure fire in the past three years. Right. Yeah. Not pinking on them, but it's like, Hey, if you're going to go that route and you're going to expose yourself and you're going to tell everybody how, how shitty they are, then at least come with it with facts of like, Hey, I could say that based off my experiences because of this, 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 and this, and this is what I found out. Right. All right. So, Hey, there I'm okay with people exchanging thoughts as long as at the end, there's some sort of learning that happens. Right. Sure. If you don't possess the knowledge or experience to make that happen, then just shut the fuck up about it. Right. Like, <laughs> exactly. Like, why are you wasting everyone's time? That's yep. just my opinion. Well, it, when, um, 
few years ago, I got my bachelor's and when I was grad, when I was going to, to walk, we were all herded in this one room and there was all these young kids, 22, 23 years old with the same degree that I've got fire protection administration. And they were talking so much shit. I mean, how they're going to do this, how they're going to do that. And then, uh, the guys right next to me talking all this shit about how they're going to change fire department, all this stuff. And they've got this degree and they can just walk on any fire department. I realized they'd never been on a fire truck ever, you know? So it's all this education without any experience. And I oh, thought, yeah. man, that's just a, you're going to have a really hard first year. If you ever come a fire department, you get, <laughs> they tell you clean the shitters. You're like, I didn't go to college for this. <laughs> oh, dude, you're not kidding. And Steve Robertson says it the best. Uh, knowledge is theory until proven otherwise. Right. And Mike Tyson I mean, that, says, everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> and more people need to get punched in the face. Absolutely. And that's all there is to it. You Absolutely. know, you know I just... <laughs> I don't know. Like, I, I think that's kind of like the fire service is a blue collar job and I love education and I think it's great, but somewhere along the line, we've kind of gone far left and, and people think that like, um, education is the only thing that matters. And mm -hmm. although it's important, right. Let's not forget the fact that like, you have to get your hands dirty, right. You could sit in a classroom and I tell everybody this, like, all right, you could sit in a classroom and learn how to drive a car. We all have driver's licenses and that's great, but you and me drive very different, right? Um, just because you have a driver's license doesn't mean that you should be driving, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there's all these variables that go into it, but yet, hey, we all have driver's license, right? Right. That does not make us the same. That does not make us both safe drivers. That does not mean that we both deserve to have one. And Dale Earnhardt had a driver's license. I mean, these NASCAR people have driver's license, but they're in a next level. <laughs> next level, right. <laughs> the and next that's the whole thing. That, that's what the fire service needs to understand is great. You have a degree. Awesome. Hey, you're fire one and fire two certified. You have an EMT and paramedic. Awesome. Are you by definition a firefighter? Yes, you are. Does that make you a great one? No, it does not. No. That takes no. time, effort, and energy, period. Right? So, hey, even if you've spent 20 plus years in the fire service, does that make you a great firefighter? No, it does not. Seniority okay. and experience are two different animals. Two different things. So we're talking about the fire service being like this unique animal. It's really no different than any other trade. You want to, when you call somebody, because you have a problem in your house, whether it be plumbing or electrical or something like that, you are wanting the best person for that right. job. Hands exactly. down. You do your research, you look through what's the first thing that everyone does. They look at the reviews of this person, like all of these things. Like you make sure that your selection is as good as it possibly could be for yourself. Yes. We don't have that luxury when someone calls 911. They don't get to sit there and go, oh, I'm having a medical emergency or I, my house is on fire. Let me just sit here on the computer and fight, figure out what the best fire department is. Yeah. I'll wait till B crews on. I, I'll let my <laughs> house smolder till tomorrow. B crews yeah. on. I'm yeah, good. no, like <laughs> they need service right now. Yes. And and they are hoping, right? Because in their mind, when they call 911, everybody's the same. They're right. all trained to the same level. They're all going to come provide the same service. And that's just not true. And no right? matter what, what they get themselves into, we have to get them out of. Right. No matter what horrible, and I've always said that we respond to an uh, infinite amount of problems with a finite amount of tools. And the only thing that bridges the gap is our brain and our, and our training. That's it. Yeah. And dude, I've seen it. Like I, some of my, my friends, uh, my best friends are amazing tech rescue people. Mm -hmm. Okay. You talk to them and they will tell you story after story after story of how in a classroom setting, scenario based setting, what they did should have worked, but it didn't. And they had to figure out how to fix it right there on the spot. Right. Right. So the reason I bring that up is like, that's no different than us showing up to a fire ground, right? Something we put into action that should in theory work is not working. It's time to shift gears. What is your plan? Do you know how to fix it? Okay. That is going to happen to all of us at some point in our career where we're going to get thrown a curveball and we're going to have to call the audible and figure this thing out. Absolutely. What is your audible? Have you trained for that? Do you have the information that you need to make those decisions appropriately? Right? Right. And that's really all it is. That's what I urge everybody to think. Our basic fundamentals that we learn across the board are pretty basic. Most firefighters understand those. But if all you ever do is keep it basic, you, 
are at a severe disadvantage, right? You're the weak link in that company. If you got a company, like there's, there, there's a, a gentleman I work with, it's next level training. I mean, this guy, he, he, every chance he talks, every time he talks to me, I learn something, put it that way. And he's the lowest rank on his truck and he's always pushing training and he's always taking it to that next level. Um, it's amazing. And, but again, he's the lowest rank on his truck and everybody on his, on his company, they pretty much do what he says when it comes to training. Like they'll, be, they'll have some plan. He'll go, no, no, we're, we got 3000 feet of hose to lay today. So we're going to do that today. <laughs> he's like, wow, but nobody argues with him because yeah, his hey. passion and his knowledge. And he's the first one to tell you that, Hey, I don't know everything. And, uh, but you gotta, you gotta take that extra step and train. You gotta, you know, everything that I'm like, he'll, he'll tell you everything that I know is not something I invented. I listen to other people and I try to implement it. Oh yeah. There, there's very little of, uh, what we do or what any of that stuff that, that any of us have invented. Right. Right. Usually what, what we've done is we've taken a class or somebody has showed us something and we have just tailored it to work for, for how we need it to work. Right. right. So we've modified it a little bit. Um, that's the other problem. Everybody wants to like be on the cutting edge and like make all these new fancy things. And it's just confusing firefighters, right? Like mm -hmm. enough, enough with the gimmicks and the tricks and stuff like that. Like let's stick to what we know works and how do we know what works by data, right? By people who have been on scene of things who have said, okay, listen, um, tying a hasty harness in the middle of a fire to pull a victim out is not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just good luck. Um, you'll get a girth. Imagine the fireman best. that does it though. <laughs> oh, like, right. <laughs> the guy that's that actually is bitch. successful. <laughs> Hold yeah, on a second, oh, fellas. Man. Let's not just drag her out. Let me tie this hasty harness real quick. <laughs> yeah. And I'll do it in 10 seconds. Watch this. Right. Oh, I want to meet that guy oh, man. or gal, whoever. Go <laughs> be on my um, podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is, that's legendary. That's what that is. Um, but you know, like the best you're going to get is a girth hitch. Yeah. We all know that by firemen who are going to fires, who are putting their hands on victims and things like that and filling out the surveys have proven that over 80% of our grabs, the victim was removed by dirty grabs, just grabbing and going, right? Right. The point I bring that stuff up for is, hey, whatever it is that you're doing, right? Don't just shoot from the hip. Like, there's a reason why, like, experience plays a role and, and how that data plays a role back into what's going on in the fire ground. And, you know, it's just nobody knows everything. Nobody knows everything. We just take a, a we take the information we have and we apply it to where we feel it should be best utilized. And then we get in a result. And right. if that result isn't what we want, then guess what? We're back to the drawing board it is. So this guy you're talking about with training, hey, I give him the credit for saying it. Like, I don't know everything. I just know X, Y, and Z works. And this is what we should be doing today because there's obviously a deficiency somewhere where everybody else needs to be brought up to that same speed. Right. And often in training, we're so like, we, we want to go, we want to go, we want to go, we kind of want to escalate it. But we fail because we haven't made sure that everybody understands the basics yet of this principle. And it's like, oh man, we're pulling hose again. We pulled hose for the past three weeks. Yeah, we've pulled hose for the past three weeks because some of you guys aren't getting it. So when everybody's on the same page here and you can pull hose any way you want, eyes closed, blindfolded, like whatever, then we'll move on to something different. But we're but coming it, back to hose in three or four months to make sure it's stuck. <laughs> right. Like, think about it. How many times in training have you seen people been like blindfolded or, or you know, their Nomex put over their mask or whatever and told to do something? Mm -hmm. But they weren't told to do it with their vision first so that they truly understood it. And there was no like progression. Like, okay, now you did it with your vision and you know how to do it. Now I'm just going to kind of take your vision away a little bit right? And see how you do there. And then there's that building before we go blacked out. Instead, we go blacked out immediately. Like we throw them with the worst case scenario. Like you're never going to be able to see when you do this thing, mm -hmm. do it now. And it's a training scar, right? Like you have to make sure that like everything has a purpose and it's built upon mm -hmm. so that like in the heat of the moment, it's instinctive, right? You ever see a guy on a hand line, like get to the fire and you're like tapping him on the shoulder and you're like, Hey dude, why, <laughs> why are you not flowing water? <laughs> oh, oh yeah. 
because <laughs> in their mind through training scars, if they put the fire out, they got in trouble. Yep. Right. When I first came in, it was you, you never put water on smoke. You don't put water until you see, until you're right on top of the fire. And I right. got second and third degree burns following that. Uh, you probably can't tell, but under these headphones are some glorious ears. I mean, some beautiful. <laughs> I mean, I look, if I took them off, you'd say, wow, there's a wing nut right in front of me. But I got those burned at a fire because the guy behind me, I was, <clears throat> I was new at the job, uh, only year on, he's pushing me. He's like, he goes, don't, don't, I said, can nobody yet? No, 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 get up. And, you know, we basically in the fetal position and I got burned because, and we could have hit it from the outside, transitioned right. inside easily. I mean, without any issues, but you know, that's, that's the way it's, it's how I was taught back in the day, but a bunch yeah. of old people that that was the accepted way to do it. You know, and then I always say that, uh, you know, you think about who saves the most firefighters on a regular basis is not a firefighter. It's Dan Madrakowski, you know, and Steve Kerber, those guys save our lives every single day. They go to work, yeah. they save our lives. And for you not to know their name or what they're doing, shame on you because you right. get to go home because of the work they do. Well, and they don't charge for any of it. Oh, no. It's like literally you can go online and download those PDF files. Any, any one of the yep. studies, right? Yep. It just, it's laziness, right? It, it is. But again, I think some of it is people just their ego. They want to think they've been doing it right this whole time. They have a well, hard time switching gears. Here's, here's another thing I say, like when we do the culture class, right? Um, I tell everybody, it's like, listen, understand that some people rather argue for their own limitations than to realize there are none, right? There are no limitations. So the people will make every single excuse available of why not to do something just because they don't want to do it. Yeah. Whether because they're, they're afraid to fail or whatever their excuse is, there's always something because they just generally don't want to do it. Yeah. Versus yeah. seeing like, hey man, I'll print it off for you. I'll do all the work. I'll even put it in a nice little binder for you and I'll give it to you. All you got to do is read it. Right. They still don't want it. No, that's, too, but they're the same people that they'll tell you that they know the exact schedule for the day. As far as, you know, uh, the wheel of fortune comes on at seven o'clock and, you yep. know, we gotta, we gotta do that. And I gotta take my nap and, you know, they're yep. very regimented about certain things and they've got the time to do it. Uh, just reading it to your point. Just, well, some of these podcasts out there, uh, pop in Coralie Moore and just listen while you're sitting down at the firehouse. If you don't learn something from Coralie Moore, then you're doing something wrong. I mean, you're listening to Kurt okay. Isaacson, you're listening to all these people. Um, learning in the fire service isn't hard today. It just isn't hard. It used to be back in the day. It had to be an IFSTA book. It had to be maybe a magazine, like you said earlier. Learning should be a lot easier. The information is so much easier to get. And yeah, there's a lot of it. There's, I mean, sometimes it's hard to decide what's right and what isn't. But the information is there. To, and, you know, uh, I got a captain I work with and I love his idea. He says he asks his firefighters for three hours a day and that's it. An hour cleaning the truck, cl uh, checking the trucks and cleaning the house, an hour of physical fitness and an hour of training. He goes, after that, the rest is your day. And, and that he tries to stick to that every chance he gets. And I, I think that's amazing. That's, that's what it takes. It is. And, and, you know, it's like, nobody likes to be micromanaged, right? Right. Like, nobody likes to come in and have their entire day already planned out for them, you know? Um, so I get that. I don't think three hours is, is a lot like, uh, for us in, in Wyandot, um, our shift starts at 7 AM. All right. So guess what? When I first got there, I'm like, Oh man, I gotta, I could get on things. I gotta start doing things like whatever. And that's just the way I was, I was brought up in the fire service, you know, Hey, like when, when you start somewhere, like, responsibility is on you to do everything. So mm -hmm. get it done. It was very weird because the mentality there is like, Hey man, like don't start your day stressed, right? Here's what we're going to do. You're going to come in. You're going to get a pass down from the guy before you grab a cup of coffee, sit down. We're all going to sit in the, the watch room. We're just going to talk. We're going to enjoy each other's company. Talk about the shift before whatever. And we're going to ease into our day. So at eight o'clock, everybody's gears off the truck, the oncoming crew, their gear goes on the truck. You check out your air pack, you do this, and then we start cleaning. And then we're done usually by like nine or nine 30. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's a team process. Everybody's pitching in. Right. So it, it was very weird for me at first. Cause I'm like, Oh man, I'm just used to getting in and just getting right at it. And right. uh, what I've, what I witnessed after several months is it actually builds 
a lot of camaraderie. You know, you, you build that, that team dynamic, like you share a lot of laughs, like all this stuff versus like, Hey, I'm isolated from everybody. Right. Right. Everybody's off doing their own little things. And then like, no, it just completely different. So that's you know, a good way to up. start your day though. Really? It's not, I mean, like you said, you're not starting out stressed. You're, you're, you're easing into it. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's, it's great. And, and it's like, you know, I, I don't know. I, I just think like people are going to bitch about whatever they want to bitch about, you know, but you can either work for a micromanager or you can work for a place that fosters a good culture that, you know, realizes the importance of their people and the benefit of making sure that your morale isn't insanely low and ignoring the problems that exist. When you have something that you can do, that's going to boost your morale that literally costs no money. Well, it's a no brainer. I, I, I hate to stop you there. And I'll tell you why, because I really wanted to get into the culture part of it. Cause uh, like I said earlier, you, uh, before we start recording, you said on Corley Moore's uh, podcast um, that culture is the personality of the department. And that just melted my brain and it got me going down different rabbit holes and trying to improve things. Unfortunately, I don't have time. I've got a heart out. I apologize. That's but right. I would love, love, love for you to come back so we could talk about build your culture because I probably have more questions on that than I've been bugging you about uh, search and rescue. Yeah, uh, no, that's fine. I've totally enjoyed it. And, you know, Every other, and I say I've got more questions for you. I hate I hate to do this to you, brother, but I do appreciate your time. I appreciate you, man. So let's do this. Let's just schedule something else, and we'll get those questions answered for you. That's that's exactly what I want to hear. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so yes, much. For sure. All right, brother Sean Duffy. Thank you so much for being on my podcast. Thanks for having me, man. I had a blast. Today's podcast was sponsored by Fire Facilities, designers and manufacturers of realistic, built-to-last training structures and mobile units for 30 years. Make training count. Visit firefacilities.com for more information.